Good evening. And welcome to Kama, our city of Morganton Municipal Auditorium. I'm Ronnie Thompson, the mayor, on behalf of the city council, and I believe Mayor Pro Tem John Cantrell is in the house, and Councilman Sidney Simmons is here. We welcome you to Kama and this extraordinary event that's to take place tonight between a planning group and the public in Burke County, and uh, especially the citizens of Morganton. I'd like to thank uh, the help we've had from the county. I think Scott Mulvey, council, uh, is in the house. The county, uh, BEDC, the hospital, the realtors have all worked together to pull this plan together, and it's been fantastic. I want to ask Sharon Jablonski to come up and start this situation. I've asked her to uh, do some very brief remarks, which may be a first for Sharon, she tells me, but uh, she has said that she's got some brief remarks. Please, this is your meeting. We ask you to please be orderly and respect everybody. And at this time, I'll call Sharon to come forward. As Ronnie said, I'm Sharon Jablonski, I'm the Main Street Director. I had set a goal personally of for 300 people, and I think we made it tonight. I am so impressed, guys. <clears throat> this is an exciting evening, and I want to thank each of you for your time and your consideration. Many of you here tonight, I know, worked with us in 95, 96, and 97 when we adopted the first master plan. And some of the set challenges set before us then seemed monumental, if not insurmountable, and certainly too big for a city our size. <clears throat> but we rolled up our sleeves, got to work, and for our efforts, got a seven-screen multiplex theater, downtown housing for the first time, full-service restaurant with Yanni's, which attracted then more wonderful restaurants, Streetscape, City Hall, Morton Trading Company, 400 Union Square, Morton Station, Wayfinding, and so much more. So can you imagine what we're getting ready to do now? <clears throat> now here we are in 2017, looking at a whole new set of possibilities. This time certainly more comfortable in our abilities to see these projects through, but still nervous about getting it right. This process has given our team renewed energy and determination to make things happen, and I'm gonna tell you that all of you being here tonight has really rejuvenated me, so thank you. For the first time, we have an arts master plan being developed within the downtown master plan, which I believe can be yet another economic driver and play a role in developing partnerships for far beyond what we have seen to date. It is so important that we set ourselves up to be a great community for the North Carolina School of Science and Math and to welcome them by having the right opportunities in place. So while you watch this evening's presentation, think about how you can be a partner, a developer, or the entrepreneur to make these ideas happen. They don't happen just with city staff. They happen because of you. I know many of you look at these renderings Oh, excuse me, I know many of you will look at these renderings and think, wow, now when's that going under construction? <laughs> I so wish it were that simple. But as a developer or an investor, you have the ability to get it under construction. Or the next thing I get is, wait a minute, you're going to put that XYZ company out of business if you put that there. And that is certainly not our intentions. If anything, it is to look at a business and place it in a better position while evaluating the building so that it reaches its full potential. Again, I ask you to please remember these renderings you have seen in the lobby, and you will see more of during the presentation, are just that, a picture of what could be as things change over time, or as we find developers and partners who can make these plans become a reality. I ask everyone this evening to keep an open mind, if I haven't said that enough times, Master plans give us a direction and goals from which to work, but they are fluid by nature. I and the city believe in being progressive, and we all want our downtown and subsequently our city and county to be the place to do business, to work, to play, and to live. At this time, I would like to introduce our consultants for the downtown master plan. They have been incredible to work with. 
You will have the opportunity to ask questions after this presentation. I had a number of you ask me that. And we are going to have, we've got a mic on the right and left, and Abby and um, Gentry, who works with me, who's my events coordinator, and Ed Phillips, director of tourism, will be at the other one, and they will bring the mic to you, so do not be shy, folks. Um, <clears throat> so if you need to make notes to yourself, please do. The firm's name is Stantec, and they design with community in mind. I want to tell you a little bit about them because it's really the first time we've had the opportunity to share with you just how great they are. The Stantec community unites approximately 22,000 employees working at over 400 locations across six continents. They collaborate across disciplines and industry to bring buildings, energy and resource, environmental, work, and infrastructural projects to life. Their work begins at the intersection of community, creativity, and client relationships. Their local strength, knowledge, and relationships, coupled with world-class expertise, have allowed them to go anywhere to meet their clients' needs in more creative and personalized ways. With a long-term commitment to the people and places they serve, Stantec has the unique ability to connect to projects on a personal level and advance the quality of life in communities across the globe. I will tell you they bring an impressive group of people to the table. If you were one of the ones that got to join us during the charrette week, they had some 13 folks from varying disciplines that created and put together the foundation from what you will see tonight. Uh, they were such a pleasure. Please join me in welcoming, and I see that Amanda Morell is actually back in the back, but Amanda Morell and Craig Lewis with Stantec. Thank you, folks. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. There you go. This is a fantastic turnout, and this turnout is a testament to two things. One, the quality of the staff that you have and the relationships that they have with this community. And two, this community's desire to roll up its sleeves and make really hard things and sometimes some easy things happen to make this community a better place. So you should all be very proud of yourselves for being out here. You all are now part of the committee, and you will be tasked with a number of responsibilities before we leave. The first of which will begin, take out your cell phones if you have not done so already. This is your first major task of this planning effort. If you can go to this website, if you have access to that, stantec.cnf.io. We'll have a series of questions throughout the presentation that we'd like your feedback on. And so, to participate, this is not scientific, but it certainly gives us an idea of who you are and what your thoughts are today. So, let's go ahead and get started. All right, a couple warm-ups. So, the first thing I'm going to start with is we are not going to go so long as to infringe on whether we see the Warriors and the Cavaliers play this evening. So I will promise you that. How many Golden State fans are there out there? Steph Curry, North Carolina boy. There must be some native Clevelanders out there, because I don't know who would be supporting them. Awesome. All right, next question. When you go for vacation, maybe this summer, or have you been on vacation already, where do you go? Stantec, S-T-A-N-T-E-C, dot 
www.ghostbusiness.io. My pleasure. Last question. Whoever asked that question, how old or young are you? A little bit about, I can kind of see out in the crowd. We have a good, good bandwidth going on out here. Fantastic. I have to say, this is one of the most diverse groups that we have ever worked with. And again, it's a, it's a testament to you all as a community. You know, I think one of the things that we have really appreciated about getting to know your community well and working with many of you all here in the room is that there are a lot of folks here that care about this community. You all have invested in it, young and old, um, working, retired, uh, folks that have uh, been here your entire life, uh, maybe multi-generations, uh, folks that just moved in last week. Um, but there is something about Morganton that people really grasp onto and they, they feel like you all can make a difference. Um, that this is a community that people can grow old in and make a difference in. And again, I think that's a testament to the opportunities that you have as part of this planning process. We began, um, and I'll, what I'll say and what Sharon said at the, at the outset is that the, the, the discussion that we're gonna have this evening is one of opportunities. These are not final ideas. These are the first opportunity that we have to put all of the ideas that have been presented, illustrated, vetted, and filtered into one place. That's all this represents. It's not an adoption, it's not a final, uh, these are simply opportunities. You may own a piece of property that we took some liberties with. Um, if so, you're welcome. Um, you may be interested in some of the opportunities that we have presented. I think one of the things that you'll see about some of the, the, all of the efforts that we had is that you have a lot of buildings to fill with better opportunities over time. You have a lot of lots to fill before we even really start to talk about replacing the existing buildings that are there. So with just a few exceptions of which we had the property owner's permission, um, you will not see buildings go away and be replaced with other buildings. Again, because we have lots of opportunities to do these things. So that's my disclaimer at the very beginning. You're going to see lots of ideas, some of which may stick, some of which may not. Um, they're all just simply ideas at this point. A big part of this effort this evening is one of those uh, cornerstone efforts is about community outreach. And we really feel very strongly about it. When we do our planning work, we want to really get to know the community we can draw these plans from afar, but they're never nearly as good um, as if we're here living with you for a week at a time or longer, um, getting to know the community, understanding what your desires are. And so outreach is really, really important. Uh, I saw many of you all here have participated in one way, shape, or form. By a quick show of hands, um, how many people have been to at least one event previous to this evening? That's pretty good. We're about uh, maybe 62.5%, somewhere around that range. I'm not as scientific as the computer. Um, in addition, we, uh, we, we sort of started this effort with an online survey. We had over 500 participants, uh, fantastic responses. That helped to formulate some base goals, some ideas um, as we move forward with that. Uh, we've held a, a number of focus group meetings. We had um, about 200 or so folks that participated and be able to sit down and talk about very specific issues with very specific groups. Um, and that happened about a month and a half ago. That helped, again, formally, formulate the basis of largely what are the things that are sacred and most important about this community that we don't want to change, or if we do, we just want to spit shine a little bit? Um, and where are those things that we really want a lot of effort to go in and, and make some big changes, find those new opportunities, and make those next steps? 
Um, we, you have some really great places here in this community that you didn't have uh, 15, 20 years ago, some of which are the tap houses and the breweries. Um, they are, uh, by their nature, uh, across the country, uh, great opportunities for creating vibrancy in, in towns like yours as well as larger cities. Um, and you all have a couple really good ones uh, with more on the way. So I think that the opportunity to be able to just step in and, and hang out for a couple hours and hear from you all, uh, I think was really important. Um, and we had some great, great feedback um, as part of that. Um, we also did walking and biking tours. Uh, a number of you all participated in that. And it gives us an opportunity to ask you some real questions. We actually talk about things like, you know, is, does this place feel safe? Does it, is this an area where you want to walk? Is the sidewalk broken? Is there a light here? Is there a, you know, what, what about it feels good, feels bad? Uh, some of it's qualitative, some of it's quantitative. And it really helps to, again, inform where the areas are that need the most change. Um, we also took a look at um, uh, these other opportunities, particularly from a cycling standpoint, um, looking at the way that we get around. And I think that's important. Um, the culmination of all that uh, effort up to this point so far has been the charrette that Sharon mentioned. We were here for an entire week. We set up shop on the ground floor on Union Street. Um, we set up a, what we call a parklet right out front. So if you were walking by, odds are you probably saw us. Um, and it was an opportunity for people to come by at any hour that they feel comfortable. It wasn't the normal process that perhaps you've been through before where you have a two hour time slot in a three month period of which to show up and give your input. We want to give everyone the greatest opportunity to be able to participate as much as you can. So in, as Sharon mentioned, 1997, you all adopted your last downtown master plan and boy have you all been busy. This is a community, I'll say, we're, as a group, we are particularly picky about the communities in which we work. Um, early on, we made decisions about um, the, the folks that we would work with, and we really wanted to know that they were willing to roll up their sleeves and do the hard work after we were done. We do the easiest part of this whole process. It's fun. We love it. We enjoy it. Um, but we don't live here, you all live here, you all have to implement these ideas. And we recognize that Morganton really has been an award-winning um, opportunity uh, for folks to create great things here in this community. So you've had a lot of really great results um, since then. I mean, up to 2007, the, the number of things that you can check off this list were tremendous. Um, and even since then, um, in the last, really, 10 years, things have really taken off. If you're looking at a bell curve, you are working your way up, you're probably two-thirds of the way up the curve. I mean, you're really starting to hit your stride. And I think one of the things that we've been inspired by Sharon and the mayor and the staff that's here, um, that they live by this motto of you don't have to live in a big town to big, do big things. Um, and the things that you all have accomplished have been amazing. The, we have a hard time finding any other community that has built a full screen, first run movie theater right on their town square. It has had so much new investment in restaurants and breweries um, right you know, within a couple blocks of one another. Of the streetscapes that you've made investments in, the public spaces and the parks and all the great things that you all have done. Uh, during that time. It's been wonderful. But 10 years ago, you had to sell this vision. Today, you're really telling the story. And so what we're looking to do from this point forward is to turn the chapter and to continue that story that you've been telling all along. We start with two guiding principles. I think it's really important to kind of center ourselves. Why are we doing this? Why are these things important? What's most important about what we do? Well, number one, when we think about our downtowns, it's all about putting people first. And it seems like a simple thing. Of course, that makes sense. We're people, everyone out here, we're all people sitting here. It's the people that walk around. It's the people that shop. It's the people that go to restaurants. It's the people that relax and enjoy the the shows in the park, and do all the things that are out there. It's not the cars. And unfortunately for many of our communities, we've spent a lot of time investing in how we make cars happy. 
And a lot of times in deference or you know, at, the, at the deficit to pedestrians. So we need to flip that. That's really important. And so if we think about putting people first in every decision we make going forward, a lot of different decisions will be made. The second one, life begins at the square. The courthouse square has been the historic center of this community. When this community was originally founded, it was a circle. You look at the old maps with the courthouse right at the center of it. There's still remnants of the old city boundary that still appear out there. Um, it's the cultural center, a lot of events and activities. It's the emotional center for the community. It's a high point in this area. You can see the, the cupola of the courthouse for miles around. And so it's important that putting people first and understanding that life begins at the courthouse, at the square, that those are the two organizing principles for everything else that I'm gonna talk about this evening. From there, we get seven key goals. And that sort of organizes all the great opportunities that you all have going forward. The first one, and perhaps the most, uh, we'll say bold, um, but we'll also say obvious, is we need to restore two-way operations to your one-way streets. The one-way streets were perhaps a good idea at the time. Um, we were all turning our uh, streets and our downtowns into highways so that we can get cars through them a lot faster. You know, this was a, the 50s, 60s, primarily 60s, 70s. Uh, we had limited opportunities to move around our communities, so the highway department said, you know what? We can make it easier to get people through your community. We'll just create what we call a one-way pair, and people will whiz right through, and you won't have to worry about any traffic jams. And that's, in fact, what they did. And what we have seen is that you've built new roads, you've made new connections, there's been other highways that have been built, and now these now are no longer necessary. Uh, the, the amount of traffic uh, has actually fallen significantly since they were originally constructed. Um, and so it's important that as we go forward, we think about what are the great benefits to, to, that we have to be able to do that? Well, there is, in fact, one good benefit, as I mentioned, of one-way streets. They move cars faster through your area. So if you're interested in doing that, we have a solution that you already have in place. But two-way streets for a town like Morganton are a far better solution. Why? Well, most importantly, because they do put people first. They slow cars down a little bit. They make your downtown a destination, not a drive-through. Okay. They help to reduce confusion. I know even the locals have a hard time navigating. I've talked to many of you all. We've seen many people turn the wrong way on one-way streets. Okay. And most importantly, retail does not like one-way streets at all. There's a reason why the retail is not thriving on some of your larger one-way streets. It needs two-way direction traffic to survive. Okay. So the bottom line is we have great opportunities to be able to make these changes um, and move them forward. Um, the, 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 we've run the numbers. We had our traffic engineers run it. You know, these are sort of the existing conditions today with the one-way. Um, Darkest green, I think, on the, is the, the best operation. The lighter green kind of declines a little bit, but we grade things, as traffic engineers tend to do, in very simplistic terms, from A to F. And in fact, many of the places that you all probably go to on a regular basis say, this place is amazing, I love it, can we just sit, walk around, can we spend lots of money, can we do lots of things? The traffic there usually probably is rated at a D, oftentimes an F, in terms of congestion in your downtowns. So a little congestion is good for a downtown. Now, if it extends for miles, that's a problem. But we're not talking about miles. We're just talking about a couple of intersections. But the reality is, today, they're in great shape. If we go ahead and move forward 
things to 2040 and assume that, in fact, traffic will continue to grow, which it really hasn't been, they continue to be great. So you see the little bit of blue that shows up on these towards the end, where things decline just a little bit, but they're still in great shape. They're still a C, okay? Not a problem. If we convert things to two-way operation, you can see we're still in great shape. So we've got the numbers to sort of back us up. Things are not going to melt down. It's not going to be a terrible place. The traffic will still move just fine. In fact, in many ways, it will move better. You have a great network of streets. People will be able to get around um, perhaps even better than they do today. And more importantly, it resets the balance to putting people first and to making downtown a destination. So we've got lots of great uh, partners in, that have done this around North Carolina and around the country, some that are close, some that are a little bit further. So we've had conversations with DOT about it, um, and they're actually pretty much on board with us. Um, of course, they did say, you're welcome to do it, use your money. Um, but we'll figure out how we create a partner out of that process. Um, we also we have to resolve the ends um, as a, as where the splits happen and resolve them back. They're actually all relatively simple to do. There's one that's a little bit more complex um, to be able to navigate around. But in general, um, they're all pretty simple. Um, it's a little bit of inter intersection changes. We've got to change some signal heads around. We've got to move things, some signage, which frankly you have to do anyway. Because the signals are all timed incorrectly today. Um, they're a little bit older. Your signage is substandard that's out there today. That has to be replaced anyway. So some of these things are things that investments that would have had to be made anyway. Um, and so there are lots of great things to do, but this is not a huge expense project. You've done much more expensive projects as a community. But the amount of impact that this one uh, inve infrastructure investment has is tremendous. We think that that's important. That's why we put it right at the top of the list. Um, it also impacts the square, how people navigate around the square um, and be able to do that. And there's lots of great ways to make that happen. Um, this is the existing conditions today along Meeting Street. We restore two-way street operation to that. We can actually reclaim some of that asphalt and create actual bike lanes that are safe and protected that people will use. And it connects to a larger network where people can get around this community. All right. One of the things that also came about is the problem with one-way streets, one of the many problems of one-way streets is that you're only looking in one direction. No matter what time of day, you're only looking in one direction. And so we have a lot of properties that you tend to only see in your rearview mirror. And one of those is at the end of Sterling Street on the north side. It's a row of properties you can kind of see from, look on the right side of the screen here, where there used to be a home. Um, the, the wide Sterling really stops at that location and sets up a place that says this is an important location. Great opportunities uh, come out of these. And we actually found the old home thanks to the Burke County Museum, History Museum. They were, uh, they were able to find what the old home used to look like. That was a pretty grand house there at the end of the street. In fact, that's what we used to do. Historically, we put the grand homes at the end of the street so as you approach, you knew where the most important people lived. They can kind of look down the street at you. But that's a, that's a, a great location to really think about. Um, but right now, you only see that site in your rearview mirror. You'll never look at that site today head on. You'll never know it. And it's right here, right at that location, that lot right there. So that's what we're looking at today. You know, let's think about installing something. First, let's get two-way streets going again. Add those bike lanes, make them more substantial. Um, the next thing is, perhaps let's install some temporary ideas. It doesn't have to be a permanent building. That may take some time. Maybe it's a fun play place. It's a, a dragon slide uh, to take advantage of the nature's playground, encourage people to play in the downtown area. Something simple um, and something fun in that area until the market's ready for a more substantial building that anchors that site. 
So we've taken what is a negative, which can only be seen in the rearview mirror, and we've created a million dollar property, simply by changing those streets around. So we'll spend a little bit of money to reconfigure the streets. We're going to start to gain it back on creating value on properties that are today value less. Number two, let's maximize the courthouse as a flexible public space. You use it a lot already, but you use it basically in the situation that's in. It's not ideal. There are a lot of things about the courthouse square that are not ideal um, that we need to, to make some changes to. These are not new ideas in the sense that they were brought up in the 1997 plan. It's time to get them done. Um, you've been using it quite a bit. In fact, I would say that you use the heck out of it. Um, there's a lot of things that happen. You're, um, events on Friday evenings, you have lots of big events and small events. Um, it's time to really think about how that gets used in a better way and be more intentional about it as public space. Right now, there's residual spaces out there where buildings used to be and then we just grassed it over, right? Or there's a gravel lot. It's not intentional. It's the center of your community if you're going to spend any money for it to be the most intentional space in your community. That's where it needs to be. So we've got a number of different strategies, I think, that are really, really important. Um, you know, landscaping is critical, uh, making sure that landscaping should be very formal around the square. It always has been and should be going forward. Um, the lawn that you have to use needs to be maximized. Um, right now, you sort of adapt to what you have based on where you can put different things. Um, we had a lot of uh, folks that talked about the idea about creating interactive water. Um, spray grounds or fountains or things like that, having water in and around the square being very important. Um, and then looking at a more permanent multi-use structure that can be used for all of the different things that happen in the area. So we have a lot of uh, ideas. Uh, we created somewhere on the order of 10 to 12 during the charrette. Um, those got filtered down. Uh, we made the best of. We combined some things. Uh, we've got two options for you all to think about. These are the existing conditions today. The sort of historic courthouse runs about there. Uh, the rest of this area is not considered part of the historic courthouse square, um, although there were older buildings there at one time. Um, in fact, the old jail building, uh, which is the current home to the Burke Arts Council. Um, you will notice, I will say up front, that that building goes away in both of the schemes that eventually out of all the 10 that we looked at, that building would go away. Again, not a new conversation. It's been going on for 15 years or so. It's not that the Burke Art Council is going away. They pioneered taking over that building, which was a negative, and they made it a positive. They made it sort of the best that they could. Now it's the great opportunity, and great arts councils usually do this. They inhabit the next building where they can pioneer and take over and regenerate that space. Um, and so it's time to be able to reclaim and, again, be intentional about the courthouse square, be able to do that. So we've got a couple options. Option number one, option A, um, is placing our uh, amphitheater area at the corner um, and picking up on the idea that we've got uh, the courthouse, actually, because it's, it's so historic, it's such a center of the community, it's also a point where surveyors mark their ties to. There's a USGS monument that's listed there. So we decided to pick up on that idea and really play with the idea of having this sort of directional idea built into the fountains and other elements in the landscape. And tell the story. You know, one of the things that a lot of people do in a lot of different communities is they, they explore. You park, you walk around, and you get to learn more about the community by the story that's being told in the landscape, in the buildings, and, and the narrative that's all out there. So this option A gives us, um, it creates more space than we have today. Currently, if you go to the, um, uh, the concerts on Fridays, the stage actually is right up here. So we can slide the stage back and reclaim all of this extra area as seating. Um, we'd reset some of the, uh, the lawn so that it's more usable um, and create a grand staircase that takes you down to Meeting Street. So that's our option A. Option, that's what that looks like. So that's the courthouse. There's the stage area. Looking up towards the courthouse, you can see how large that lawn then becomes by moving the stage area to the back. Large fountain area anchoring the other side of the, of the square. 
Option B, we take the stage area and we move it to the center. We sort of create this nice multi-use uh, stage right in the center. We actually level up the lawn a little bit more, so this is all really all at about what we call the same grade, so all at the same level, more or less. Uh, we have two areas off the back that drop off uh, to lower seating and areas that um, can be shaded. We want to plant more trees, more shade trees that are out there to be able to use this stage. The stage is going to be up. It's going to be up high enough, in fact, because many of you all know that the lawn slopes. We're going to re-slope the lawn so it's up a little bit. So the stage would be up. We'd actually have enough room underneath to have almost a complete ground story. Underneath there, we could do bathrooms, we can do storage, and a lot of other things can happen underneath that pavilion space. So it becomes very multifunctional. In fact, both can do it well. This one, in fact, does it better um, because, we're, because of where it's located. Um, and that's what that image looks like. Again, you can see the opportunities and how much larger that lawn becomes. And we know that you get such a great turnout for a lot of your events. We really want to be able to utilize that lawn as much as we can. All right. So we've got a couple different approaches. Take your phones out. I hope I didn't bias anyone with my comments. So I'd like for you all to, based on sort of those initial ideas, whether the courthouse, whether the, um, the stage is at the corner or the stage is in the center. That's really what we're going to be asking of you. Number three, focus activity in the core. And we talked about this already a little bit, but I think it's critical. You know, the great communities have sort of intense areas that are in the center, and you know when you've arrived, when you've hit that what we call the main main. People drive through there. It may be your first time in the community, and you know you've gotten there because all of a sudden there's stuff that's happening. There's people crossing the intersections, and you know that something has changed. And so we really want to make that change happen. We don't have to make it happen across all 60-something blocks in the downtown area. We really just want to focus on five or six blocks. In fact, we really just want to focus on a couple of intersections. Most importantly, the sort of Union and Sterling intersections are the most prominent, um, but Union and Green a little bit as well. But really, the, intersec the intersections and blocks that are right around the square, that's where the, the most focus needs to occur. And it's important. We, as part of this effort, we retain the services of a retail market consultant who does a lot of work in communities your size all over the country. Um, and she uh, did some studies early on, took a good look at it, and made some recommendations as part of it. I mean, right now, the reality is, is that over half of the ground floor is occupied by what we call passive uses, things that close up at 5 o'clock or they otherwise look closed most of the day. They could be offices, they could be vacant, they could be something else. And the problem with that, it's not that the people that are working there are bad people. They're perfectly great people. The problem is, is that as human beings, we're idiots. We like to be entertained every 50 feet. And we've been studied, and anytime you've been to a mall, there's cameras watching you, and they know that if you walk more than 50 feet in front of a blank wall or a dead space, that you're two or three times more likely to either turn around or cross to the other side. We're human beings. It's something embedded in the chemical structure of our brains. Believe it or not, it has a lot to do with fight or flight. Because when we see a blank wall, what we see is, I don't know, is it safe? Should I keep walking? Is there something worth walking to? Is it going to be safe when I get there? And because we can only see details so far, usually only about 100, 120 feet, every 50 feet matters. And so focusing activities in that core are really, really important. And so the development opportunities that we have and the, the ideas that have been presented are really in a couple of different locations, but really focusing on those key gateways and those key intersections um, you can see these on the boards out back in a lot more detail going forward. Um, all of the yellow represents housing opportunities potentially or commercial mixed-use opportunities. Lots of great spaces. None of those are tearing down of existing buildings except for the building owners that said, please take a look at my building 
tear it down and give me something else. Um, we know that a lot of times downtowns have a couple of different what we call markets that are out there. We know that the residents, you all who live here, are really important consumers. You're the day-to-day -day consumers of the things that are happening in downtown. But you're also very finicky, and your expectations for what might happen in downtown are going to be different than other people that are coming into this community. Um, we know that the sort of the best opportunities that we have are within a five or ten minute drive of the downtown area. If you're getting in your car and you live five or ten minutes from the downtown, you have multiple choices. Do I go to the shopping center? Do I go to that shopping center? Do I go to the downtown area? And people who come from the downtown area are looking for a different experience. They're not looking, generally, you're not looking to save the most money. You go to the strip center for that. You're looking for an experience in the downtown area. Um, and so the resident's needs versus the visitor needs often are different, but there's an intersection there. And in your community, the intersection is that adventure, that entertainment, that experience. And the, you think about it, the things that have become the most successful in the downtown area are things where memories get created. Places you can eat at, you can you know, meet your neighbor, you can grab a beer, um, you shop a little bit at a, at a unique store um, that has just different stuff than you would normally find somewhere else. And you're treated differently when you walk in that door. And so there are a number of key recommendations, the first of which is, you know, bringing that nature's playground into the downtown area and thread those sort of things to do, what we call them, things to do around the downtown area. So it's not just, I have to go way out to hit the green area. This is a place where we can actually do stuff right in the downtown. Um, we want to look at creating visitation okay, with non-retail, we call ambient um, impulse entertainment. Okay? And really what that means is, again, more things to do, the farmer's market, uh, more activities, more smaller activities. You know, things that will attract 50 people or 100 people, not 500 or 1,000. And some of these things, a lot of these can be done by the individual merchants that are there. They don't have to be done by the city or a whole slew of 100 volunteers to make things happen. Um, most importantly, we have to figure out how we get rid of a lot of these blank walls and dead spaces that happen in the evening because we want to keep people walking around the downtown, moving from place to place. Um, Again, we've got a lot of really prominent locations. Good people live behind those walls. You just wouldn't know it because you never see uh, any evidence of human activity. And so part of it's just a marketplace. Right now, office, offices are willing to pay a little bit more rent than retail is. But we're moving up that scale, that curve, as I mentioned before. We're getting to a point where retail can actually afford to do a lot of these things that the offices were generally doing beforehand. We want to fill in the gaps um, that are out there uh, with what we call similar district recruitment. What do we mean? Go to another place that's about your size and get someone to open a second location here in Morganton or steal them because you're better than they are. Okay. You know, go to places like Hendersonville, go to places like Asheville, go to places like Hickory. Find the places that are doing really well there. Invite them over here. Um, we want to enhance the tools and things that you have, upgrading the website, you know, providing more tools for folks who are interested in investing in your community because you're in competition with you know, 32,000 other communities around just the United States for the same eyeballs. So you've got to stick out. And you, people only have so much time. The website is the way to be able to grab that information. Um, retail attraction is really important. Retail attraction comes in two forms. The first is, as I mentioned, you go out, you send a delegation out to have dinner, and then you invite that owner to come to your community. The second of which is, you got to have the space for them to come to once they get here. So those are often two different groups of people being able to do that, but we want to work with the property owners to understand their lease terms and their expectations so that when they get here, we have a place for people to arrive at. 
And so what we want to do is be able to fill spaces like this along Sterling Street, um, perhaps temporarily or even permanently, so that you want to keep walking in that core area. Right now, it's a dead block. It's the widest sidewalk you have in their community, and it feels dead. So we want to fill it with activity. The way, best way to do that is to get active uses in that ground floor. Um, we want to, you know, the blank walls that you have in your community. When I sort of pick on Wells Fargo, it's your worst offender in the community. It's not only a big, literal blank wall, but it's painted white, so it's luminescent, right? So it's shining at you. And so we want to do things that really help to downplay that. It could be a simple mural. And you all can argue whether or not you want to do a landscape mural or something fun. That's not my concern. What I say is have fun with it. And it doesn't have to be permanent. Okay. Um, the next thing is think about the sidewalk that's out there. And maybe that's a place for kiosks and small vendors. So you encourage the startup businesses to be able to sell things in, you know, the... 240 beautiful days that we have in this community, they can be out there just like they are at the Grove Arcade in Asheville, where they're out there. They can do the same thing right in your courthouse square, right at the corner of the main main at Union and Sterling, where everyone's going to be driving through in both directions when we fix the streets. Um, and then um, when we look at the old Kimbrell's building um, at the corner of Union and King, again with the property owner's permission, uh, we looked at the great opportunities that we have to be able to have not just ground floor mixed use, retail preferably, and restaurants, um, but also housing in there. Housing is really important. Again, right now, this is a street that you tend to see in your rearview mirror. Um, but that site is so prominent. It's in such a great location. In fact, we're not satisfied to just simply do three stories. Let's go four. And the views from those penthouses will be the best ever. I mean, you can see for miles in both directions, the mountains in both directions. You can see into the community from that area. Um, again, million dollar views um, right up there. Let's diversify and expand the housing. Um, there's a huge demand in, in the housing in the downtown. In fact, there's a premium in the downtown today. We know that there are a lot of vacant lots that could be housing locations. We don't have to fill them with commercial spaces, frankly, because we already have commercial buildings that we can uh, re-inhabit. Let's look at some of these va vacant spaces for housing opportunities, perhaps. Um, we know there's a demand. There was a study done just a couple years ago uh, that showed a pretty big demand, about 1,000 housing units in the downtown area. We know that because there's a premium. We know that because the people that are looking to come here can't find things, and they go to another community. That's the last thing we want. We want them to come here. And as you're attracting jobs, as you're attracting uh, new things that come to your community, those people are going to be relocating and looking for new housing. And you happen to have a bit of a housing issue, uh, finding good, high-quality housing in this area. And a lot of people that are coming to your community are going to be want, they're want to be as close to the downtown as they can be, because that's where the center of things are. So we've got a great opportunity to be able to do that. The 1,000 housing units are not all going to happen at once. I always have to remind people that happens over a period of years, typically one economic cycle, which is about 10 to 12 years. Uh, could be 7 to 12 years. Um, so it's about 100 units or so every couple years. Um, but we have lots of opportunities across the square mile that we're talking about. So don't think about 1,000 units that go straight up. People always say, wow, 1,000 units. We're going to look like Manhattan. No, you won't. <laughs> You're going to look like the rest of Morganton, except you filled in your parking lots where you tore down buildings years ago. That's what it's going to look like. You filled your parking lots back in. You filled the gravel lots in. You filled the vacant lots that are in there today. So there's a big premium that's out there. Um, what we call the Flatiron District that's out there by Fontaflora. Um, two great Flatiron buildings that are out there. There's great opportunities for new infill housing um, that are in that area. Uh, we've got a couple different options for how that fills in. Also, option for a new boutique hotel in that area. It can go a couple different locations. So you can see filling in lots that are not occupied today with new uh, buildings. Um, that's what that would look like. So on the right here, Fontaflora sits right there. That's Fontaflora is right there. Everyone knows where that place is. I know that for a fact. So this is all new housing. 
That's a new hotel, potentially, um, and new infill and new uh, re-inhabiting. That's that wonderful location at the end of Sterling that we mentioned earlier and what that looks like. And you can see then it drops down right into the neighborhoods. You're right. Thank you. Um, along Union Square, uh, we've got lots of great opportunities for new housing. They come in two different forms. Some may be what we call detached bungalows around some small common open space. Others may be, um, so you can see what that looks like. So new housing, sharing some common open space, but a little bit denser than the neighborhoods that are surrounding it. Again, what we're looking for is essentially low maintenance lifestyle options where your living room and your outdoor space is the downtown. That's what people are looking for in the area. Again, it's not for everyone, but we know that there's a sizable percentage of the population that's looking for these opportunities that are not satisfied by the supply that's out there today. So that's option one. Option two is townhomes that might be out there. There's townhomes that are out there today, so sort of building on that model. Um, and then looking at uh, just the little infill studies, um, also on Union Street, we can get four homes, we can get a number of townhomes, some more infill in that area where there are two buildings today. And again, with the permission of the property owner, we looked at the opportunities that are out there. And these, this is how you get to 1,000 units. You do it five or six or eight or 10 units at a time across an entire square mile of the downtown area. So we get to the southern area, the southern depot. We've got a lot of housing that's going in, the old mill. Um, which is wonderful and being able to re-inhabit where this is the farmers market area today so by way of orientation you're going under the bridge at Sterling and this goes up to green that's Sterling today um, you can see all the opportunities for new infill on sites that currently aren't occupied today so again not, not taking up any opportunities um, infill at Oak Hill um, in that area again six or eight or ten or twelve or twenty units at a time uh, where there currently are empty spaces. Um, even filling in some parking lots over time. Everyone asks, you're going to take away parking. Parking's already a problem in the downtown area. I'm here to tell you parking is not a problem in your downtown area. I'm trying to make it a problem in your downtown area. But it is not a problem to find a parking space. It may be a small nuisance to find a parking space within 30 feet of the front door in which you want to go into. <laughs> but we've got lots of opportunities to make and take advantage of some of the asphalt that you have that's prime real estate. You don't, put, you don't give prime real estate away to parking. Uh, you put it where people are, where value is. You move parking one block away. And heck, we all need to walk a little bit more anyway, don't we? Right? Our doctors are telling us this. So... Um, what's 300 more steps? So taking advantage of that, being able to fill in these locations, new housing opportunities, but be playful about it. You know, that we're actually not building a waterfall. We're not doing that there. It's paint and having fun with paint in the asphalt. We can do different things. Nature's playground, right? We need water. We're up on the top of the hill, so we don't have any water that goes right through the downtown, so let's be creative about it. Um, and then looking at improving the housing stock around the area, particularly around the neighborhoods, I think it's really important that you're surrounded by some really great neighborhoods, some of which need more love than others. But there's some really great programs that are out there that other communities have done to make investments in those areas where communities can come forward on a block-by-block -block basis. If you can get all of your neighbors to agree, hey, listen, we're willing to sort of upgrade things here, um, that there are, there are folks we can bring institutional dollars to help restore some of the grandeur of the homes that used to be there. Um, just as an example, in Oswego, New York, where we're also doing some work, um, the program that they have there, you get everyone to sign on, they've got uh, restoration grants to help the homeowners um, upgrade their homes. We, you know, we know that there are some great opportunities there. Some of those homes just need a little bit of TLC. So we need to look at all of the neighborhoods that surround the downtown area not just within the downtown area. We want to connect to the larger community. Um, downtown is the center, it's the intersection of the, de of, of the greater Morganton area. So in terms of how we connect folks, we talked a little bit about how you get around um, on car. We're going to 
not make it as super easy as it is today, but still be able to navigate quite well. But we also want to be able to connect by bike, which is a, a big, sort of the fastest growing part of mobility today, is being able to get around by bike. And we want to connect to all the great opportunities that are happening all around. We're, in fact, we were at a meeting earlier today, coordinating all of our efforts, both in the downtown. There's also another planning process going on right now. There's a meeting tomorrow night. If you want more details, I'm sure Sharon will tell you that later on. Um, to look at the parks and recreation master plan, upping the, updating that and making sure that your greenways go where you want them to go, that you have parks in the right location, and that they, are, they have the right programs in the right locations. Um, in addition, um, there's another planning process that's looking at the old Broughton campus. They're what they refer to as the district, the North Carolina state property. Um, and so that's the area in pink that's down below. How we get all of those things to connect to one another so they all work seamlessly. Right now, you pretty much drive by everything. There's no synergy between any of that. We're in a new age. We don't want to introvert things. We want to make sure that everything is well connected. That's really important. Um, we evaluated walking and biking around the area. I mentioned that before. Um, you all gave yourselves about a, a 16 out of 30. So we rounded up. We gave you three stars. Okay. So it's an okay, but you have a long way to go. Um, again, it's making lots of little investments. These are not, you got to go out and spend $8 million to make this stuff happen. A lot of these are cans of paint solutions. I'll be able to do that. You don't have to move curbs or change things. All of these things are really important. As we approach in your gateways and the southern side of things, um, we're approaching on Sterling Street. Um, does anyone know there's a downtown beyond? Um, this is like, I made it through that horrible intersection at Fleming. <laughs> and beyond this, there be dragons. <laughs> and not the good kind. So once we reclaim, again, we don't need four lanes moving up through here. Um, once we reclaim it, we actually will narrow it down to three, because we'll have lanes going in both directions. We'll have one lane, right turn lane, that will take you up to green, if you want to go up there. And we get a whole extra lane that we can use to create beautiful landscaping, a new gateway treatment, and a new multi-use path that connects people around to the uh, rest renovation of the mill and all the folks that will be living down there. So lots of things. And then, you know, we can slap some signs to the sign of the bridge. We're doing this in another community. Um, whether or not you ask permission from the railroads, I'll leave that up to you. Um, that's the evening view of that. College Street is another great opportunity. College Street, we think, is probably your best way to get to the Broughton campus down there. It's the most direct um, to be able to cross the street safely, when I say the street, Fleming, right now, until that intersection uh, changes dramatically, which is going to take a long time and a lot of money. Um, the Fleming, the College Street intersection is much better uh, to be able to cross over. And then it connects over to the campus where there's an old unused rail line and the greenway that they're planning and other things. This is the existing condition today. I'm part of it. Um, be able to actually add bike lanes that are wide enough and they're painted green and so they actually feel different. The idea is that college becomes a parkway. So it's an urban greenway coming up into your downtown area. So that's one section of it. Um, where it's wider today, where you have four lanes, which are totally unneeded um, today. Um, in fact, the city already has a project they're looking at narrowing it down uh, to two lanes. Essentially, they're looking to do this. Uh, spot medians, more landscaping opportunities. We call dedicated, protected bike lanes so that if you're a novice, if you're not part of the spandex crew that's out there Saturday mornings, biking everywhere you want, don't care about traffic, you fear nothing. Um, this is for everyone else. And so the idea is to okay, create that linear parkway, that linear greenway from Broughton all the way up into the downtown area. In fact, all the way through and then connect all the way up through the northern area. We want to embed art into everything. I think that's critical. That's a big part of what this community is today and how we move it forward. Um, there's lots of great spaces for art today. Um, the action plan has many different bullet points in it, but ultimately 
we want to engage the artist community to be able to fill spaces, sometimes temporarily, sometimes on a more permanent basis. Um, so we take advantage of, <coughs> excuse me, corner of Avery and Green, um, being able to fill it with maker space so that it's a place for artists and other people who make things to be able to do things in that area. Um, it could be a place that's inhabited by a local institution. It could be a partner like Western Piedmont, or it could be another institution that fills that area. Um, even here at Kama, wonderful building on the outside, or on the inside. On the outside, it's pretty bland. And you can see that this is called a fly loft, which is this big ceiling up here. You can see it for a long ways. It's pretty dull. Um, you know, let's have a little bit of fun with paint. Make it do something different with it. Um, let's fill the spaces that you have. This might be the new location for the Burke Arts Council. Again, pioneering into the new building and then filling the space next to it. Um, you know, more mural opportunity all around. Create a scavenger hunt, tell a story, do different things around the area. Um, you know, it could be a small alley where you've done a great job already investing in it. Keep it going. Don't feel like you've got to vet it through a committee for eight years. Do something quick. You know, it doesn't have to be permanent uh, to be able to do that. And ultimately, have fun and experiment. And I think that's really critical. Inject some whimsy into the area. The space that's behind <coughs> um, Brown Mountain Bottle Works, um, it's just a dead alley. They're sort of starting to use it right now uh, for space, but we can reclaim it really an, on a temporary basis. It still could be open, but they can use it for outdoor seating and create a courtyard space where there are a lot more things that can happen. The nice thing about spilling stuff to the outside is it creates this ambient noise. And people are attracted to that. Again, we feel safer if we're in an, env an environment where we hear other people. And so we want to do more of that the more that we can all throughout. Even in front of the city hall, um, being able to fill that space with new uses and activities and get more people walking around these areas. Um, and then today, in front of Catawba Brewery, you know, in, along Sterling Street, will be two ways here hopefully very soon. Um, we've got a big lot that needs to be filled along the prominent street in that area. Could be filled by some food trucks as part of a food truck rally on a temporary basis. Uh, and then over time, perhaps Catawba Brewing moves onto Sterling where they have a prime address. They have the brewery operations behind and a major restaurant and brewery and other operations up front. We know that a lot of this has to do with hard work. We presented a lot of different ideas, a couple that are big, that will require coordination by the city fathers and mothers um, so that those things happen. Tax dollars have to do it. There's two or three of those that you all have seen. A lot of these other things are hundreds of different little ideas on a block-by-block -block basis, even on a square foot basis, where you all can have an opportunity to continue to inject new ideas and new life into these areas. We try to leave you with 10 ideas that we think are most important to be able to help focus over the next five years. Um, you're going to be uh, evaluating these here in just a minute, so pay attention. Uh, number one, let's go ahead and complete that two-way conversion. We actually think it can be done in the next five years. There's a few things that have to be done in terms of studies and detailing, but otherwise we're almost there. Um, we need to focus on being able to make sure that the ground floors, in fact, are, contain only active uses. Number three, increasing the retail and restaurant uses on the ground floor. That means going out and attracting folks to the area, attracting a hotel to the downtown area. People have talked about that. Actually, getting a hotel in this area is quite hard, which we discovered. Um, the uh, Hampton Inn, for example, your newest hotel in the area, stays pretty full most of the time. Um, a lot of people were surprised by that. That's true. Number five, let's go ahead and move the Arts Council to pioneer a new block. Talked about that a little bit. Let's begin the Courthouse Square improvements. You've been talking about this thing for 15 years. It's time to just get it done. 
Um, let's construct at least 100 new housing units in the area. It's not something that the city does, it's something that the city helps to facilitate that other people do over time. Let's convert College Street to that parkway that we talked about. Let's go ahead and bury or relocate the overhead utilities that you still have left or they're out there, particularly along Sterling. Interestingly, you have some overhead lines on Sterling Street that the only thing that they do are power the street lights and the trees. <laughs> so I didn't know that trees needed power, but apparently they do here in this community. It's easy to be able to make those changes, but when we do that, all of a sudden we can plant real trees. Today you can't plant real trees, so we want to be able to do that over time. And let's go ahead and create that outdoor space behind Brown Mountain Bottle Works. So, last, last poll here, pull your phone out. Pick five. We'd like for you to pick five of those top ten, what you think are the most important things that we need to take a look at. It's a little like watching a horse race, isn't it? <laughs> All right, another few seconds. See some clear winners and preferences out here. Clear support for the two-way conversion. Clear demand for new retail and restaurant uses. Let's get that courthouse square done. That seems to be the most popular. And that outdoor space behind Brown Mountain Bottle Works um, and their new neighborhood neighbors out there as well. Last chance to vote. Again, not scientific. Gives us some direction. Excellent. All right. So when we're done, at some point. How will we know we've succeeded? Well, the first is Union and Sterling are going to be full of people day and night. Lots of movement going on, people crossing the street. Cars will know they're, they're second-class citizens. People will know they're in charge. The retail and restaurant rents will outperform the offices. And that's, you know, we're, we're moving in that direction today. We'll know we've arrived when we've added at least 200 more housing units to the downtown area. And we know we'll have been successful if we actually have a real parking problem. You can hire us to come back and figure out how we meter spaces. No one wants to meter spaces. I'm happy to do it. That's where all the great places are doing right now. But that's where we are. So you have a lot of work in front of you. Uh, we still have a lot of work left to do um, as part of it. Um, but I think in all, as I mentioned, you've got a couple big ideas and a hundred little ideas for you all to get started with. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you very much. We do have a few minutes, I'm told, for some questions. We'll be able, uh, we have some wonderful assistants to be able to do that while they are uh, moving the mics around. I do want to take the opportunity to thank uh, some of the members of my staff who are here. You've interacted with them. You'll be able to see them afterwards. Um, Amanda Morell, um, who has been the project manager for this effort, uh, and uh, she's been uh, very involved. Dylan McKnight, uh, who's also here, and Ashley Bonowitz uh, from my team is here as well. They have spent, we've spent a collective uh, almost three weeks here in town doing many different surveys and living here, doing lots of different things. So we've really appreciated the hospitality.